Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to bring this new episode of Common Ground. And our guest today is Malcolm Collins. And as always, is my co-host and friend, Dave Hamilton, the founder of the America's Future series. Malcolm Collins is a big figure in the pro-natalist movement, and he cares a lot about maintaining that our world's population doesn't go into irreparable decline. Our society doesn't fall apart. What got you into this, Malcolm? So I first started caring about this issue when I was working as a venture capitalist in South Korea. I was the director of strategy at the number one early stage firm in the country, sort of similar to our Y Combinator here. And as a director of strategy, you know, I'm supposed to be plotting where the country's economy is going to be in 50 to 100 years. And the thing that was blindingly obvious to me, so if you look like, for example, today at South Korea's fertility rate, it's 0.8, 0 0.789, 0 you know. Frame of um, who is sustainable. Yeah, well, so it means that for every 100 Koreans alive today, there's going to be around 6.1 great grandchildren. Uh, that is, you know, and this is assuming that it doesn't continue to decline, and yet it's declining every year. So I went to the other people at my firm, and I was like, this situation seems like, like there isn't going to be an economy in 100 years. W what are we doing here? <laughs> um, and they were like, yeah, I mean, everybody in, in sort of the financial classes of our country broadly is aware of this. We just pretend like it's not the case because like I'm a VC, like I have to invest. And that's my job, right? Like I'm not gonna just go around running around like the sky is falling, even though the sky is falling, like collectively we pretend like it's not. Um, coming back to the US, it felt a bit like going back in time uh, 20 years. Like it was some dark mirror episode or something like that. Um, and and it, so in the U.S., people will be like, oh, our situation isn't as bad as theirs. I mean, we are today where they were in the 90s in terms of our fertility decline. And if the U.S. continues to have fertility to decline at the rate it did between 2010 to 2020, um, that means that if we have a generation every 30 years, uh, we should expect for every 100 Americans alive today, there to be only 3.7 great grandkids. Now, keep in mind, this is assuming a continued decline, and I can give you the stats for that if you want to link to that, but it's it's wild how bad things are. And what I learned in Korea with a few things, there does not appear to be a floor on this fertility decline. Um, a, a lot of people, they think, well, eventually it'll get so low that it'll just even itself out. A lot of countries have undergone this. Not a single country has hit that floor yet. Uh, and there's also a belief that, okay, well, maybe society will begin to adapt when fertility rates get really low. Yet you can see in Korea, in fact, the exact opposite thing is happening right now. If you look at Korea right now, the really big thing is the four no's movement, you know, among women in the country, right? Like no sex, that? no dating, no men, no marriage, right? Um, and it, it is it is horrifying. Uh, and, and so a lot of people look at this, they're like, what, do so you just care about this from an economic perspective? And it's, it's true that yes, this will lead to a, global economic collapse unlike anything we've ever seen before to understand why that's going to happen uh historically we have this perception i think in 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 the west right now that economies only go up like on if you shift money onto the stock market grow but that's happening consumers has been growing exponentially the number of producers has been growing exponentially and the number of productivity per producer has been growing linearly yes technology has been increasing exponentially but the productivity per worker has been increasing linearly for about the past 200 years now if those things level off or start declining we will be in an economic context where things are shrinking on average uh our entire sort of civilizational structure right here, not just like Western civilizational structure, this is true in China and Japan and Korea as well, um, is set up on this sort of Ponzi scheme uh, where it requires constant growth. And this isn't just because of our various social security programs, which yes, are completely screwed, but it's because of the way that we've handled debt. Debt is this miraculous thing where if I make a $10 investment and $8 of that is debt and $2 is equity, and that investment grows by just 20%, you know, I have doubled my equity investment, but if it shrinks by just 20%, I have lost my entire equity investment. We have taken out debt at the level of individuals, the level of our states, the level of our land, the level of our cities, the level of our nation states. It's just leverage to the floor. And this was amazing when things were growing, but if they ever start shrinking, everything begins to fall apart. Now, this is really important because there are other problems due to demographic collapse. And what it means is by the time that we recognize these problems, it'll likely be 
too late to fix it for two reasons. One, because we will have a much bigger crisis, which is the economic crisis. But two, it's a problem that Korea is facing right now, which is called the pig and the snake issue, which is to say that um, in Korea right now, 60% of the population is over the age of 40. You know, you can have a population where like 80% of the population is over the age of 50 and be like, okay, now we've decided we need to solve demographic collapse, but you just can't at that point, right? Uh, in Korea, if it's, it's almost statistically impossible to solve the problem now uh, with before just like total social collapse. Yeah. Um, and this is really terrifying. So so again, what's the actual problem here? Like the, the biggest problem to me as somebody who, who believes that society's greatest strengths is our diversity is you are going to see a great dying, like a mass cultural extinction event where many cultures around the world are just going to disappear over the next hundred years, uh, much, much more so likely than even during the age of colonialism. Um, and to, to people who purport to care about cultural diversity, this should be a big issue for them. And, and, and to take a step back here, a lot of people are like, oh, this is code for white people. Like he's talking about white people when you, when you talk about this. But if you look at the cultures that are most resistant to prosperity-induced demographic collapse, you're looking primarily at conservative Christian and conservative Jewish populations. Native so Americans are really fucked. Like the, if you look at Native American birth rates, they're- Oh yeah, 1.2. Native yeah. Americans are one of the most fucked groups. Uh, uh, generally white conservative groups are the least fucked group in the entire world. Um, uh, East Asians, South Asians, Native Americans, um, all completely fucked. And, and I suspect we'll also see South Americans get fucked too if you look at current rates. So, you know, you talk to progressives about this and they're like, oh, we can solve this with immigrants. And then you point out to them that, you know, uh, even by the UN's own statistics, which famously inflates these numbers, as of 2019, all of Central America, South America, and the Caribbean fell below replacement rate. That yeah. means they are not reproducing themselves within every population. Yeah, they're collapsing rate. as well. India fell below replacement rate this year. <laughs> It, um, so, so real quick, this seems to be primarily an awareness issue, okay? You're aware of this, and I think a lot of Rudyard's followers on Walter Baltist are, they're, they're very intellectual, they're up on these things, et cetera, and they're aware of pronatalism. What would you say, is is the average American or the average person in Western America, uh, I'm sorry, Western civilization, even aware that this idea exists and that it's a problem? You've used the word scary, frightening, et cetera. I don't think a lot of people are actually aware of this nor are policymakers uh, aware of this issue. They don't think this long-term. Yeah, so it's very interesting that you point that out. A lot of people, like when I'm talking with reporters, they're like, why is it all of these like Silicon Valley tech bros are are, are aware of it, are like talking about this, but nobody else seems to be talking about this. And I'm like, well, let's be clear what you mean when you say that. What, you, what you're asking is why are venture capitalists aware of this, but the people who you are friends with, your social circles, not aware of this? And the answer is, for the same reason I first realized this when I was a venture capitalist, is that venture capitalists are about the only class in society today that regularly needs to think 50 to 100 years in advance. Um, if you're looking at like Wall Street investors or something, they think maybe five years in advance, maybe 10 years My in quarter. advance, but that's long term. versus narrative too. What almost everything in our society is built off narrative, and if you look at, yeah. especially so for the left, everything the left say has to fit inside one of their key narratives. And there are very few social classes today that have to look at numbers. And this is a weird tendential point, but I was watching Ingvar Bergman's *The Seventh Seal*, and I love that movie because it shows the end of the medieval world. And my speciality is the Middle Ages, and so that speaks to me. And what you're looking at, the movie set during the Black Death, is that this society has no frame of reference for what's going on. Because it's a society where they said their entire world is built around God loving them, and then half the population is dying of the plague. And that's kind of where we're at now, where we our society doesn't have to look at numbers for anything. And I think the reason the VCs, the people who pick up on this, is if you're a VC, you look at numbers. But the things that, I like to say the things that will kill modernity, and I do think the modern world is about to end in the same way the medieval world ended with the Black Death. That mm -hmm. um, the thing modernity can't deal with is it can't think in long term and it can't think on gradual incremental issues. And I'm kind of mixed on climate change. I don't really know what to believe, but climate change is the exact sort of problem that would mess us up because it's a gradual increment, incremental issue. And in previous historical societies, you had all of these social rules 
that might have seemed really stringent in the short term, but in the long term saved your society. If you look at like all of those Jewish rules, and Malcolm's got a lot of points on the Jews that are positive. <laughs> I got to throw that in. But um, but if you look at the Jewish laws, it sounds incredibly stringent until you realize this is a very isolated, very weak population in one of the hardest places to survive in the world. And by only by having these incredibly stringent rules, could they survive the waves of attacks and the fear of assimilation and everything? Yeah. So in our book, The Pragmatist Guide to Crafting Religion, and on our podcast, Based Camp, this is like a core thing we talk about a lot, which is if you look at human evolution, you know, this was my background. I actually have, I worked on an exhibit that's still in display at the Smithsonian's, like a uh, human origins department and stuff like that. So I was really into, you know, human evolution's research back when I was a scientist. Um, and I, I think that we often underestimate uh, how much humanity is a co-evolving firmware and software package. Uh, so when we're talking about like, are biologically coded like social predilections and stuff like that, which I think the general population underestimates how much of our sociological profile is sort of her heritable. Um, but on top of that, uh, we had these mimetic packages. And today when we think about memes, we think about a meme infecting somebody and then using that person to infect other people. But historically, when I'm talking about memes, I'm talking about the way sort of ideas evolve, I think of right? Fortran. Yeah, yeah. Um, so historically, uh, you had meme cultural clusters, which we call cultivars, which today we would think of as like religion, sort of. Um, and they were subject to biological evolutionary pressure. And by that, what I mean is that when they could get, motivate a person to do something that increased their biological fitness, their likelihood of surviving um, or their likelihood of having kids, um, th they would survive at a higher rate. So this is how we argue things like, you know, Judaism and Islam figured out hand washing literally hundreds of years uh, before science figured out hand washing. We argue why like, this is why pretty much every older tradition you see in the world today, uh, they have some sort of arbitrary self-denial ritual, you know, like Lent or Ramadan or Feast of the Firstborn. Um, th this is likely important in strengthening your inhibitory pathways in your prefrontal cortex, like saying no to things. It's also likely why, if you look at since Pew started recording data, conservatives have been happier than progressives. It's also likely why you have huge mental health issues in the progressive movement right now, because so many of them have abandoned this older software package uh, that, that was that co-evolved was the way our brains were meant to work. Um, and, and I can understand that it may have had some uh, uh, negative externalities. Uh, like a great example of the negative externality is you're almost always going to get uh, homophobia, like in every old, long-lived cultural tradition around the world. And it's, you know, that's been really successful. And by successful, I mean conquered its neighbors. Well, like you might find some tribe where they're, you know, okay. But if you're talking, you know, whether it's the East or the West or anywhere. Uh, but the reason is, is because... Um, Traditions that were homophobic had more kids than ones that weren't. It's and I don't think that that's like a positive to produce, thing. To be fruitful and multiply and therefore have more kids than your enemies. Right, right. But so I'm, not, I'm, so I'm not saying that all of these evolved things are positive, right? I, I'm just saying that they were really important to maintaining like a stable conscious structure and we have ripped them out. And they carried the majority of the psychological weight that motivated reproduction. The moment we ripped out these older traditional packages, we lost a lot of the motivation to reproduce. Um, and if you look around the world today, the groups that are most resistant to prosperity induced fertility collapse are the ones that are still operating on these more robust is uh, software packages. There's an interesting book. There's an interesting book named Fitzpatrick's War, and it was written in the 90s, and it's set in the 25th century, and it's about an American Alexander the Great, and it's a very fun book. But the backstory of it is that over the 21st century, modern industrial civilization isn't sustainable, and you start to see mass social breakdown as well as a breakdown of the birth rate. And you start to see giant wars, plagues, etc. in the late 21st century. But what ends up happening is that religious fundamentalists take over America because they're the people with a birth rate. Muslims colonize Europe and the Chinese colonize the rest of East Asia. And so be, the point of the book is that modern industrial civilization cannot sustain the birth rate. And thus, these groups that, as you described, have more pronatal social norms basically inherit the earth. Yeah, well, so I, I would argue that the book is interesting and it, it has a point. However, I'd say East Asian populations, like the Chinese, for example, um, they seem to be by far the most susceptible to this fertility collapse. No one can replace them, though. It's like 
the thing is, China always gets fucked by history. They've they've eight out of the ten bloodiest wars of history are in China, but there's so many of them that they and they're such a tough people that they always find a way to pull themselves up. And yeah, like I can't imagine the Siberians populating China or the Indians populating China. So there's two things I'd like you to address, Malcolm. One is making sure people understand this prosperity induced fertility collapse. That one thing may be fundamentally maybe not a lot of people's consciousness and why that occurs. Secondly, if I, I would like to propose the counter argument saying, and then have you address it, which is, so what if the population goes to half? People create climate change and they're actually a, a, a virus and a menace. We, they should, it would be good if they decrease the pr- su- surplus population, like Scrooge would tell us, right? So maybe it would be better for the world and for us if the population did collapse. And, and, and why is that such a bad thing? So those are the two things. I, I don't think people understand prosperity-induced um, yeah, so I say prosperity about. induced because if you look around the world today, the thing that is most correlated with fertility collapse is prosperity. Um, after that, it is access to education. Um, and then after that, it's uh, gender equality. Um, and, and so when I say prosperity, what I mean is like wealth. So between and within countries, the more wealth you have, the less kids you have until you get to absolutely high extremes. You get above in the U S for example, above repopulation rate again, when a family's earning over half a million dollars a year. But before that, generally the less wealth you have, uh, the more kids you're going to have. And so this goes against, I think one of the less core things where they're like, well, we should, we can't afford to have kids. That's the problem. And it's like, well, if that was true, then poor people wouldn't have more kids and poor countries wouldn't have more kids. Um, and and I think a lot of people uh, underestimate how poor a country needs to be to be above repopulation rate again. Um, so they think it's like developing countries, like they imagine like South America, like that is where people have No, South America is below repopulation rate. On average, a country in the world today is only above repopulation rate if the average citizen has under 5,000 USD per year. Um, and, and so- yeah. And so to the point that he was making Third, fourth world, if there is one. Yeah. yeah, Fourth world, you could say uh, like just desperate, really desperate poor. poverty. Yeah. Um, and, and to the point that you were making, which I think is really interesting, um, which which is to say when, I, when people are like, why, why do I care about this? Like, wh- what's the issue here? You know, when I talk about this in terms of prosperity induced fertility class, I'm like, do you not see it as a problem that, it, that, that, that we're playing this civilizational game where we are saying we can move into this bright future of equality, of gender diversity, of, of, of uh, you know, a broad access to education. And yet the civilizations that are making this promise are unable to motivate reproductive fertility rates, that their economies depend on a constantly growing population. And that they're playing this this sick shell game where they are hiding the fact that they can't motivate fertility, and yet their economies and prosperity depend on fertility by importing people by country from countries that don't have those things yet, while telling those countries that they're eventually going to export those things to them. So somewhere here is a lie. Either they never plan on the whole world developing, right, um, or their whole system's going to collapse. Uh, and this is one of the, you know, the real sick things that I, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll talk to, you know, extremist progressives about this. And they're like, OK, well, it doesn't matter that Latin America is a below, below repopulation rate. You know, we can fix our population problem by importing people from Africa. And I'm like, so you're the not racist plan is to import people from Africa to support non-working old white people on Social Security. That's how you're like profited by effort into raising your own kids. Worse, you're going to create a scenario where the entire global economy is reliant on keeping a few African countries so poor that they just naturally re- uh, uh, motivate reproductive rates due to this poverty, and then importing people from those countries. You're using them like like human farms. That is sickening that you are treating that as your like default solution to this problem instead of creating an environment where you can have a stable population. Now, I want to get to your second point before I go further here, which is people saying, oh, oh, okay, well, so what if population's collapsing, you know, global warming, blah, blah, blah. We as an organization are not trying to keep ensure the population grows or even trying to keep the world population stable. That is impossible at this point. Okay, we are on the Titanic right now. No matter what we do, we are hitting that iceberg. We are just trying to get as many lifeboats ready as possible and build some sort of community on the people who are going to have to live on these lifeboats for the years until we can build something up again. Um, I often argue that when people are like, well, what, you want the world's population to grow forever? That's a bit like somebody's talking to a global warming organization and they're like, what, you want it to get colder every year? You want us to live on an ice planet? It's like, no, the global warming's probably going to happen no matter what yet now. 
but we should like be talking about this because it's going to have major economic and sociological uh, and, and social effects. So you're going to say something. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because there's a parallel between the group of people that are very, very focused on the idea that we're at a tipping point with regard to climate. There are a lot of people that say it's too late now, one more week, one more year, 30 years from now, it's going to be too late. The notion of a tipping point with regard to population, though, is something that they don't take on. Your point is that we're already there. You're, you use the Titanic example. Um, we're going that way. And then ultimately, we, when population gets to a certain level of decline, it actually goes to zero. The idea that it could actually go to zero is unimaginable. And I always like to quote the mouse utopia experiment, right, where every mm -hmm. time they ran it, the, the population, because of affluence, you know, this was affluence, they had all the food, shelter, no, uh, no existential threats. The mice continued to grow until their population corrupted, and they, they went to a tipping point, and they always went to zero. I think that's almost an analogous model for us. There's a point where you can get to the point where you can't replace, and, and which has been one of your points. And I don't think a lot of people understand the tipping point idea with regard to population, but they're very comfortable with it with regard to uh, uh, climate change. So I, I, one thing I want to touch on with the Matthew Tobia experience, which I think is very interesting, is I think that, that you know, a lot of people talk about a post-scarcity environment. I think in many ways, like if you're middle class or above and living in, in the Western world right now, you're already in a post-scarcity environment. And that's what the mouse utopia experiments were studying is what happens to mammals in a post-scarcity environment. And we don't know, you know how accurate these experiments actually were, but it appears in at least one case. Like you may have p-hacked the results a bit. We go into this a bit in our book. But it appears that at least in some cases, this can lead to population collapse. And I think one thing we're learning in the West, and this is something that has really uh, has taken even me off guard, is that when people have everything that they could possibly have, I thought the highest level of luxury and indulgence was going to be these individuals indulging in hedonism. But instead, what we have seen is the highest level of indulgence that a person can access is removal of personal responsibility. And that is achieved through self-victimization. Because when an individual is a victim, then they are not responsible for the things that are happening in their lives. And so in these post-scarcity environments, instead of seeing extreme the extreme hedonism, I think we would expect, which we, we're actually seeing, you know, declining sex rates, everything like that. What we are instead seeing is a level of extreme responsibility shrugging, because that is something that somebody can only do when they are in literally like the safest and most indolent of environments in childhood. I think it's um, a feminine versus a masculine. I think it's a feminine versus masculine environment where the conditions you describe of post-scarcity in the late Roman Republic, which is a very masculine society, it was just like mass sex slavery. It was giant feasting and throwing up food and then eating more of it. And now we're in a much more uh, feminized society. And so I think it's, yeah. Yeah, well, and I would also encourage people to look at, because I think when a lot of people, they're looking at civilizational collapses, Rome is like the only thing that comes to mind. I would also look at the height of the Islamic empire, which was very yeah. similar. No one talks about so, that. So there's one Sorry, thing I really I, want to. There's one thing I think is really important to touch on because I, I've watched some of your stuff, I've seen your interviews, et cetera, and there seems to be a recoiling of some people. And that, as you alluded to earlier, they try to make this about race when, in fact, this is not about race. You're actually talking about Korea, of Asia, all of these other non-white areas suffering these same problems at even a greater rate, and much at a much greater rate than conservative religious whites. Okay, I'm a former civil rights activist. OK, I spent over 20 something years in the movement, wrote on it, led marches, all that. OK, I, I care about that. I don't see this as a race issue. What you're proposing has nothing to do with race. It has to do with world population. Is that a fair statement? Well, absolutely. And I and I think that, that some people like some political groups in our environment, they uh, they sort of have this coding where they see truth at the team sport and they try to determine which team are you on? And then the moment you're not on their team, you know, depending if you're on the left or the right, if you're not on the left team, they just immediately say racist, race, 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 race. So you're a racist. Um, and I'm like, I'm not a racist. Like I am like well known, not a racist. Like people who know me are like, oh yeah, you're super not a racist. My family, like historically was uh, 15 of the 50 founding members of the free state of Jones were uh, within one like either brothers or siblings of brothers of my direct ancestors. Like my family has hugely been into, uh, you know, pro civil rights stuff for a long time. Um, and I I think that it's, it's just really sort of sick to an extent that when I tell people all of the different groups that this is affecting, 
And um, when you're talking to progressives, they're like, is it affecting uh, black people? And I'm like, yes, it's affecting black people in America. And they're like, well, is there some group of black people it's not affecting, you know, like, like Africa? And I'm like, okay, no, there are some countries in Africa that this is nowhere close Incredibly to affecting. Incredibly like, okay, parts of Africa only. Yeah, and it's like, just because you can find one approved group that this isn't affecting yet, doesn't mean it's not a problem, like globally speaking. It, this is almost to me when people bring up the, the, the race thing, it's a bit like the global warming, like, Oh, it's it's winter here right now. How could it possibly be? How could global warming possibly be happening? Oh, in Africa, there's still a high population. How could this possibly be a problem? And it's like, well, presumably we want to increase their prosperity. Uh, presumably you don't want to set up a system that that minimizes their prosperity. But yeah. Uh, and to uh, Rubiard's uh, uh, point earlier, um, what I was saying is I would suggest that people, when they look at what civilizational collapses look like, because I think a lot of people, they have this perception that a civilizational collapse can't happen because one hasn't happened in a while. And it's like, well, you point out that one, we're kind of due for one. Um, and the three that I would look at, if you're looking for sort of patterns, is the height of the Islamic Empire, the height of the Roman Empire, and the height of the Athenian Empire, because we have really good evidence on each of those collapses. Uh, and you see very similar behavior patterns of indulgence in hedonism of um uh, yeah and stuff like that as ruby yard was talking about one the of tendency the towards decadence and he did an entire video on it which i i think is great everyone should check out the barbarism to civilization to decadence thing absolutely true and i agree with you 100 that people don't think this is possible because they haven't had it in a while and america in particular has been stable you know for a couple of hundred years right um yeah. and so we just we're so insular we're so protected that we can't possibly imagine it could happen to us one of the principles that I like to use is that when a civilization is collapsing, it pushes the exact opposite of what it should. And I've seen this about 10 times in history. For example, when Hitler knew he'd lose World War II, he killed more Jews because he thought that would be the best thing he could possibly do in his best legacy. When the Aztec Empire was followed, the Aztecs and the Inca, and this is one of these weird tangents that I've been gone down, they were able to actively predict the exact year their civilization would fall. And so the Aztecs were... They jacked up their human sacrifice massively in the years before the Spanish because they thought that was the only way to please the, the god, the god, so that they'd survive. For us, we're pushing these various anti-natal social norms even harder when we need the exact opposite to survive. And that's just yeah. a pattern I've seen where people double down on the behaviors that are killing them right as their civilization is falling apart. You're absolutely right. Um, and again, this is what we were talking about in Korea. But here's the really cool thing about all of this. So a lot of people hear all this and they think that what I'm really like, I'm preaching gloom and doom here. But I actually think that overall, there is a huge uh, positive uh, externality from this. So the, the, the negative side effect of this is that the sort of urban monoculture in our society, and this is this sort of culture that exists throughout the world today, you know, whether you're New York, Paris, Tokyo, wherever, right? Like, these places are often more similar to each other than they are like if I'm near Philadelphia now and I just drive out to the Amish, which are high fertility, the, the Amish are more different for many of these cities than they are from each other, yeah. right? So this urban monoculture, anywhere you go in the world, it is completely unable to motivate reproductive fertility rates. Um, and where this gets negative, I think, especially for people of conservative leanings in the near future, is that uh, for that population to stay around, for it to survive, it has to essentially parasitize or take the kids of adjacent cultural groups. Um, and none of this is malicious. It's just that the iterations of it that become more aggressive about proselytizing to children, are the, especially children oh, not of that cultural group, point. are the iterations that outcompete other iterations in terms of its population in the future, meaning that in the future it becomes more and more aggressive at proselytizing to children, of capturing educational systems, of stuff like that. Uh, where this becomes interesting is this is only a threat in the short term. Right. In the long term, this group is self sterilizing and it will disappear. Um, so in the future, we are in this amazing scenario where when I was in Korea, I kept thinking it's wild to think, you know, this country is going to have like 4% of its current population in 100 years. Where are they going to get people from? Japan? No. Like Japan's collapsing in population. China? No. Like China's collapsing in population. Um, and I was like, it's wild to think that less than 100 years ago, you know, Japan was able to motivate its citizens to go out there and kill, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people uh, to, to expand their cultural footprint, where today they can't even motivate reproductive rate among their general population. Um, but this is really cool because it means that the future of human civilization right now is controlled by those of us 
who can intergenerationally motivate a high fertility rate. Um, and by that, what I mean, like if my family, if I had eight kids and we did that for just 11 generations, I'd have more descendants than there are people on earth today. So when we look at what the pronatalist movement is really doing is it's sort of building an alliance of all of these cultural groups that are able to motivate above reproductive fertility rate right now, that are able to motivate their kids to stay within their culture based on what their culture offers those kids other than threats. That used to be a successful strategy. It's not really anymore. Um, and, and that are going to inherit the future of human civilization. You today as a human being can have more impact on the future of human civilization than you probably could have at almost any point in human history because you just get to choose in this time of indolence, do I wanna take all of this additional stuff that we have, heating, food, stuff like that, and use it to build an intergenerationally durable culture and set up a intergenerationally durable societal framework for my children and build, join this network of people doing this? Or do I wanna spend it, you know, complaining about how much of a victim I am and indulging in hedonism, you know? And it's- so this, is a, this is a kind of a hard sell at the really micro, microeconomic level. As an individual, as an atomized person who doesn't give a crap about anything else, I'm just hedonistically focused on myself, I've got the opportunity to have kids and spend my money on them, my time and my energy, et cetera, or I can go to Cabo. Yeah. And, and, and that's probably the way most young people in particular now see it, or, or they're just depressed. I don't have any money. I'm not making enough money. My prospects aren't good enough. By the way, I can't get a date because I'm a quasi incel or incel. Right. Um, so, so how do you, how do you sell this? I mean, first off, they got to find a girl. Yeah. Well, so so Maybe. there's two core points here. One to your first point is when people say I can't afford kids, what they always mean is I can't afford kids without reducing my current lifestyle. Um, and because it, well, the, the cultural groups that do have a lot of kids, they understand that you make enormous sacrifices for your kids. You stop going out on vacations. You stop, to, you know, my up. family, we don't heat our house in the winter. You know, we live in a pretty cold area. Um, we just don't do it because we're like, hey, we got more, we need more money for our kids. We need more money for the charities. You know, and, and they're just unwilling to make, I think, a lot of the sacrifices that they need and, and sacrifice their, their existing lifestyle quality. Uh, to the second point that you were making, um, relationship markets are completely broken in our society today. One of the books we wrote was The Pragmatist Guide to Relationships, and the other was The Pragmatist Guide to Sexuality. And on Basecamp, our podcast, we talk about this all the time uh, because it's, it's just so difficult. Um, and it's so difficult for two reasons. One is... Um, I mean, we could go into the, like why this is, but the fundamental structure of dating in our society has fallen apart. Um, it, it's We've created an environment um, where if you are an average guy, let's say, for example, the average male on Tinder has less than 1% of women swipe right on them. Um, that is absolutely insane when you consider how high these women's standards are. And it's it's partially because now we live in a society where people can sleep around a lot, which uh, I think messes up people's perceptions of the type of person they can secure as a long-term partner. Because for for example, for women, um, their value in, in sex marketplaces is much higher than it is in marriage or long-term marketplaces. But many of them believe that because they could secure sex partners of a certain quality, that they can secure marriage partners of equal quality, and they just can't. And it messes up all of the market dynamics. And so you can see since Tinder hit the market, you know, falling sex rates, falling relationship rates, and it's very hard for people. And so you look at things like what the Prenatalist Foundation is working on right now. Uh, we are working on, you know, arranged uh, marriage markets, uh, like a new sort of a London season. Uh, this is in addition to the educational project, which we have, which is our main project, which is replacing the educational system. But yeah, when guys say I have a major problem with dating, they are telling the truth. But a problem is fortunate, which we also talk about a lot, is that a lot of young men uh, have gotten their dating advice from, and remember how I said that sex marketplaces are very different from marriage marketplaces? They've gotten their dating advice from the manosphere, red pill, MGTOW, et cetera, right? Um, they, they, what was the thing? Dating strategies, I forget what they were called. Um, and, and, and Those are dating strategies, not marriage were, strategies. Yeah, they, they are optimized around securing sexual relationships. And uh, they do that pretty well, actually. Like all of that dark triad shiz, it actually works. The problem is, is it works at securing thoughts. The T-H-O-T is not like, um, uh, it does not secure you um, uh, the, the, the women who desirable likely actually want to marry, right? And the question is, why is this happening? If what you are advertising to women is how 
arousing you are to them, then you are going to secure as a partner the type of woman who would date someone because they are more arousing to her than you know intellectually stimulating or a compatible partner. And so learning how to date within marriage marketplaces is something that I feel that there is very little actionable advice on for young men, um, which, which is really, I think, harmful. As a well, guy who's part of this target demographic, what I'd say, and I consider myself a decently nice guy, and so I'll do the morally best thing I can do while not getting fucked over. And the um, defection rate for marriage is so horrifying that it kind of makes you, that like in another society, I'd happily get married in my early 20s, have kids. But the thing is, as a guy today, if you do that, 50% divorce rate, um, if your girl is college educated, it's even higher. Um, then she takes the kids, she takes two thirds of your money. This happened to my father. And so it's like, why are you setting yourself up for a deal in which there's a majority chance that it screws you up and you eat costs for that for the rest of your life? Mm -hmm. So these things were true in my youth and I'm in my sixties and Roger knows him. He's read it. I read a book called the, uh, wrote a book called the official nice guys guide to dating. And in that, I say all the same things we're saying today. There's a difference between the dating world and the marriage world. Uh, women have the crazy uh, list. I call it the Santa Claus wish list. They wanted all these things, right? Et cetera. Whereas the guy's list might be two or three things. Do you care about me? Do you nurture me? Will you do me? Those were the two or three things that maybe get guys cared about. That hasn't changed. It has just become so extreme. And the perception of what a quality male is versus quality female and what they'll accept, et cetera, um, the disconnect between what women think they should be able to get versus what um, the reality out there is so severe. And because as you say, there, we're talking about dating and getting our, and not about long-term marriage, other relationships like that. Yeah, so one thing I'd add to this, which I think is really interesting is yes, we're in this uniquely challenging situation where if you win, you can really clean up in the future because you know, when I'm raising my daughters, you know, um, uh, I am going to raise them to be realistic and have good expectations in terms of what they're looking for in terms of male partner. All of these women who fall into these cultural groups or who have been parasitized by these cultural groups, which build these unrealistic standards for them, they're not going to have kids. They're not going to perpetuate into the future. You know, we live in, in, in a collapsing society in a way right now, which can make it very hard to get partners. But if you do, you know, and, and, and again, there's the secondary problem of all of us used to, you know, if you look at the 1950s, my wife has this huge collection of like 1950s advice videos, which she loves to watch, which used to teach people how to do all this stuff. It used to teach girls what to expect from a relationship. It used to teach people how to court. It used to, you know, we don't have any of these cultural things anymore that, that make all of this easy. Uh, so one, we don't have the lessons on how to date for a long-term relationship for either guys or girls, right? Um, and 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 two, you know, uh, girls, and I think to a lesser extent, or, but, but to some extent as well, guys aren't being raised to act in a way that can attract a good partner. But the cool thing is, is all of us in a cultural network, like when you get married, when you start raising kids, one of the reasons why we're building out this intercultural network of those of us on lifeboats is because I need people for my kids to marry. Right. I need people who were raised by other sane people um, with insane cultural frameworks so that they, too, can have kids. And those kids want to have kids, you know. Yeah, well, so I'm happy to hear that you're trying to address you know, operationalize a, 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 an answer. So there has to be a way for like minded people to connect. There has to be a forum for this, et cetera. And you also have to be able to winnow out those who are buck naked crazy versus those who have realistic expectations. And it'd be nice if everyone's barcoded. You just go and go, oh, this person gets it or this person doesn't, right? But there's no barcoding, right? There's no little quick check. And so um, I had a I had a litmus test that I, I and I, I, I interviewed over a hundred women for this and, and, and guys. And the question is, pretend I'm God. And if you tell me today that you want to meet the person of your dreams at eight o'clock the next morning, that person is going to knock on your door and they will be there. And you will never want to be with another person. This is going to be enough for you. This is going to be great. You're going to be happy, et cetera. And if you asked men that question versus women that question, almost two thirds of the women said no. And the reverse was true. The men said two thirds of the men said yes. And this was 1990s, okay? Wow. With the, and the idea being was, but if I get married, I'm not gonna be able to do what I wanna do. It's going to be a net negative for me. But I said, wait, I'm God. And you asked for the perfect, perfect, perfect guy. And, and you say, well, I wanna go study abroad or go work in Europe. Great, he owns a chateau in France. 
All right, shut up. I, I told you I'm God, right? So this is the perfect guy. And they still said no until they got older. Yep. So I, I would add just for young guys here, the, the single biggest piece of advice I give in terms of sorting for a partner is the two big traits that you're sorting for. The absolute biggest is gratitude. Are they actually grateful to be in a relationship with you? And are they able to show that gratitude? The second is work ethic. All of this other stuff, like how hot are they? How, you know, et cetera. It does not matter. This is this matters in terms of social signaling within your local status hierarchies. It is irrelevant in the long term. Please, please, please remember gratitude is what you're sorting for and then work ethic. Well said. And then how do I find that out? And you only find that out by meeting someone and getting to know them, et cetera, and their behavior. But mm -hmm. giving the two guys the litmus test, the targets, these are the traits that you should prioritize is really important. And I don't think most young men, I don't, old guys my age didn't get that either growing up. We thought, were they hot? That's all we cared about. Right. Well, and I think today some guys are like, how submissive are they, right? Like a girl can be submissive and have zero gratitude. And I think that, that this is a, a one of these incorrect things that guys are picking up from the manosphere. Well said, well said. Um, but yeah. But I'm, I, well, I, I appreciate you're not just pointing out the issue, but also saying, here's what we can do about it. Well, I also want to point out that it is a systemic issue and people who believe that they're having trouble finding a partner aren't imagining things. The, uh, the, the, they're not crazy. The dating market's completely broken. People who look at the society today and are like, wow, things seem like really crazy. Like, are, are people sort of losing it? Like, they are accurate. Um, you know, and this is also true with our positions of power in our society. I think that there's this perception that um, at least the elite have some sort of like background plan to what's going on. You know, one, one of our, our side jobs, my wife and I has been like managing secret societies and stuff like that. And, you know, between us, you know, I have my graduate degree at Stanford. She had hers at Cambridge. Like we have been in the positions of power within our society. They are, if, if you sort of view this urban monoculture as like a mimetic virus or a sterilizing mimetic virus, I call they it are the furthest gone of all places in the world right now. Um, and there are so many little uh, like viruses that even specialize on just eating the elite. One of the things that we talk about in one of our videos is how psychology has almost become a bit of a cult. I remember, you know, I was walking behind uh, uh, three women at one of these events and they, one of them was like, yeah, I won't date a guy unless he's seeing a psychologist. And the other two were like, oh yes, of course. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because my original training was in, you know, psych psych psychotherapy and stuff like that. Um, that means some psychologist incepted them with the idea that you can't be mentally healthy unless you are not only seeing a psychologist, but you are continuing to see a psychologist. Um, I was like, that's what a cult does, right? Uh, if they build dependency instead of fixing issues, and not only do they build dependency, but they begin isolating you from everyone who doesn't have this dependency. Um, and then, so the question is, is like, why do these sort of, I, I guess you could almost call them cancer because, because I, none of this is done maliciously. It's just the psychologists who built mechanisms that built this dependency, uh, economically outcompeted the ones who didn't. And so that their types of psychology began to be practiced more and more, right? Um, and as a psychologist, they should have known not to do this. Like one of the things you're taught in psychologists is, you know, like w the hypnosis and the implanted memory thing and like how horrible all this was and that you need to be very careful about this. And then the whole field just threw that out when they realized they could make money by creating dependency in people. Um, but anyway, uh, there's all of these organizations that are munching on the top of our society right now. Um, and it is horrifying when you when you see this and you're like, they can't actually be that stupid, can they? Yeah. Um, no, they really can be. They really are. As somebody who's been close to all this, things are really as bad as you think they are. And however dumb you think like your local friend group is, the elites of our society, the people running things, they are at the same level. My, uh, my friend Sam Alberja like to say that when you look at the world, yeah. I love this point. When you look at the World Economic Forum, they're trying to bureaucratize decline. And they these people are seeing the same things. We are at the world population is going to collapse, but they want to make it a process. And I love um, McGill Christ's book, The Master and His Emissary, where he talked about the right and the left brain. If you get too stuck in the left brain, you see everything as a mechanical process. But one of the things that really shocks me is you lose. I have this test. You make an argument. Can you think that is the only argument that gets made. And among the elite today, they'll make a single argument and then there's no analysis if that argument's correct. It's just, I made a chain of logic. Thus, that chain of logic is completely correct. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the litmus, litmus tests I use for sanity 
Uh, emotional maturity, sanity. Exactly. Uh, okay. Intellectual honesty. The Talmudic read the Talmud. When guys study the Talmud, they would take both sides of an argument. I, you yeah. take it this time. I take the other one. To your point, Roger, you, if you can't think of the other argument, you're not thinking hard enough. Yeah. Secondly, yeah, yeah. I would say say this. Uh, there's an analogous model with the psychology deal, which is, oh, you you won't date a guy that because he doesn't go to the gym, but he works out all the time and he's a world class athlete at home. You won't take a guy that's got his own home gym, but you'll only go to a guy that sees a professional, right? It doesn't make sense. Is the guy in shape or not? Is the guy sane or not? Um, yeah. The last thing I want to say is this idea, this behavior has to become cringeworthy because the most important psychological tool that your generation has is cringe. If, <laughs> if something is cringe, it dies. And people have to actually make fun of the little. This is this something guy. Dave roasts me for. Dave says that the amount your generation cares about cringe is cringe. <laughs> Yeah, good. So I love all of this. I am actually going to take the alternate point. I think cringe is the only thing that survives. So, but also I love Sam. He's got some great ideas. Um, so uh, by that, what I mean is cringe is the mechanism in our society through which we realize what is culturally aberrant and culturally different and through which we punish those things. Yes. It is a culture's immune system. Historically, like if you're talking about like the old, you know, if, if we were all some like older conservative culture, yeah, cringe, because those cultures were able to motivate fertility rate. But today, when people say something is cringe, what they generally mean is it differentiates from the urban monoculture, right? Exactly. They're like, so, so what I'm saying, this thing has to be flipped where wholesome whatever you want to call those traditional values productive uh, uh, um, uh, positive notions are considered cringe now and they can't be I, this sort of hedonistic silly self-destructive thinking has to become what's considered cringe that's all right I, I mean that'd because... be nice but i think what we're gonna see happen is the people who can deal with being called cringe my wife and i you know we've gone viral a number of times like the elite couple meme everything like that people think we are cringe as hell and what they mean by that is why don't you fall in line why do you have to be so freaking weird and what we point out is every cultural group in the world today with a high fertility rate is freaking weird whether it's the amish or the hasidic or anything like out we all look like weirdo we name our kids weird things we have weird practices and we are the people who are able to walk into a grocery store and have everyone snicker at us uh, or, or be on you know the cover of a, a magazine have and have everyone snicker that. at us and not care about it those are the people who will be around in the future and i think that if you over focus on cringe if you over focus on judging other people uh then you can begin to feel that like you're okay because your relative status or your relative sanity is higher than other people today um, and I'm like, oh my God, that's such a low bar. That is such a low bar. It reminds me of when I talk to people with like, talking to some of our followers about body dysmorphia and I, because a lot of them, you know, they, they do exercise all the time. They want to be really buff all the time. I guess it's weird that there's body dysmorphia on buff the left and the right. I was like, just go to your average mall. Are you in the top... 20 to 5% of body types in the average mall, then you're probably okay. And they're like, no, 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 no. You don't understand how bad the average mall is. I promise if you're in the top 20%, you are still probably clinically obese. Um, and I was like, I think it's a bit the same way with, with intellectualism. You can look at the world and convince yourself that you're doing okay because you can see the cringe around you and you can see the, the patheticness around you. And it can, I think, over justify your own lackadaisicalness towards self-improvement. So I, I would almost say seeing cringe in the world around you is cringe. I mean, yeah, also we'll the process that Dave describes already happens where yeah. the right uses the, the right uses cringe much more than the left does. And the right uses it in general as a descriptor because cringe is opposed to based. And these are the two polarities where to do something cringe is to do something that is unnatural, bizarre, Overlooking for social approval, too um, earnest, too, too wholesome, too 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 well meaning, too in, too caring. But based as well, that is true a lot of the time. But based is the opposite of cringe, and based means what you're saying is built off fact. It is sincere. It is honest. Um, and there's a lot of politics in this. Where like no one on the left uses the term based. It's used to be apolitical, but it got co opted by the right. Um, but we we're kind of already seeing that of using cringe as a as a wedge towards pro-social values. And it reminds me of what I think we're going to see is um, I, there are three civilizational cycles each around 2000 years. The first mm -hmm. is the Bronze Age one. The second one's the Roman Empire. We're going to see the end of the third, which is the historical cycle that started with the fall of Rome. 
is that, for example, the Jews isolated themselves from the rest of civilization and they took all these pro-social norms. And I view the Jews like the Mormons, where the Mormons isolated themselves from the rest of the culture, took a lot of beliefs that other people would consider to be weird and arbitrary. But the Mormons actively distanced themselves from the rest of civilization, moving to the desert. But if any group survives this, it's going to be the Mormons. Well, I mean, Mormons have fallen below repopulation rate already. I don't know if you've seen the statistics. But if everyone's this. below repopulation rate, it's matter of the, degree. The blind, the one-eyed man rules. Well, the the Jews aren't. I mean, if you if you don't include the Jews, Jews as Jewish, which no, is like like progressive Jews, very most liberal Jews are Jews secular, are almost suicidal. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll buy that. Yeah, well, so, so something I wanted to comment on that you were talking about, um, which which is is you're talking about pro-social values, and I and, and this relates to something that you guys were saying earlier, where I think if you're talking about the progressive world mindset, they've moved from pro-social values to pro-social truths. And this is this this way of reasoning that we call justicalism, which basically means you don't ask yourself, is this what the evidence supports? You ask yourself, is this what would be true in the most just world? Um, and that is how you determine what is true within our world. You know, are men and women, men and women exactly the same sociologically? Yeah. In a just world, they would be, therefore it is true. You know, so I, I think that this is this is just something you see within their reasoning, and it's how you can get really illogical reasoning sets from the perspective of people who are more like data and tradition based. Yeah. Um, and it it leads to a lot of breakdowns in structures when you begin to then hunt out anyone who seems immune to this form of logic, because that's the way cultures work. When a culture begins to dominate in a region, it begins to expel or socially isolate anyone who doesn't bend a knee to it. Um, one of our uh, uh, fortunes in all of this is that the, the, this culture that they're building is incredibly incompetent. I, like if our podcast had a line, it was thank God that our enemies are not as male are, are not as competent as they are malevolent. Like um, and, and it's I'm glad I I thank myself every day that the left is not Stalinism because for everything you say about Stalinism, they are one of the most ruthless and efficient movements you'll ever see in history. And I think the modern left's political views aren't that different from Stalinism. They just don't have the balls Stalinism had. I'd actually argue they're very different. So here's where I would argue that they're different. And this is something we talk about a lot on our podcast is um, that historically leftism was motivated by equality. It was trying to create, um, even if everyone had less Fairness. resources, Fairness. at least they all had closer to equal resources. Now it never actually worked out that way because that creates power vacuums, which um, the, the, the argument we use in our book is you can envision an upside down pyramid, but it always collapses into the shape of a pyramid, which is just like a dictatorship. Uh, but anyway, that the new left is motivated by something different. They're motivated by the removal, by negative utilitarianism, by the removal of all negative emotions. Um, so uh, if you look at like weird things they're doing, like in California where they're trying to remove like testing from school systems, right? Because some kids fail their tests. Like, obviously that's going to increase inequality because rich kids' families will still pay for them to go to SAT prep, will still like instill these values in them, but it does remove in the moment emotional pain. Like, why are they handing out like fentanyl on street corners if like, obviously that increases inequality and, and the rich people who can afford, you know, to go to rehab and stuff like that, they get out of these situations. It's because it removes in the moment emotional pain. And I think so much of their ideology today can be understood by the promise of removing in the moment emotional pain. Whereas when we say, what is rightism today what is conservatism today it's an alliance of cultural groups that, that want to ensure intergenerational cultural transfer and yeah. intergenerational cultural thriving i agree yeah, so that. i'm your i'm your test market i grew up as a left of center classic liberal socialist um you know very active in the civil rights movement all that kind of stuff and what drove me was the desire for fundamental fairness mm -hmm. and justice and equality and that sort of thing okay that that's what drove me I can't relate to this new brand, uh, new brand, because as you say, I think absolutely the new brand group wants, wants what it wants, the way it wants it, logic or consequences be damned. And to your point, and I really love your point, which is, and I want to, I don't want to have any negative feelings, negative exposure. You have to accept me completely as I am. Any of my behaviors, any of the things I do should be accepted, no matter how good or bad they are. And you don't get to judge me. Yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Well, and what is a trigger warning, if not that? I don't want to hear ideas that could cause emotional pain. 
I, I don't want to engage with anything. But what a great system. Because when you think about emotional pain and offense, like what is that flagging for you? It's flagging things that may lead you to change your mind. It, it's flagging for you things that may challenge your worldview. Like if somebody came to me and was like, yeah, Malcolm, you're fat. I'd be like, I wouldn't be offended by that. But if they attacked me for something like, you know, I was saying, Malcolm, sometimes you talk over your wife. I am offended by that because I don't want to be somebody who does that. And I know sometimes I do that, right? So that does actually hurt me, right? Um, and and if you can build an ideological structure which flags everything that causes any emotional pain in a person and says you don't hear these things, then that logical structure becomes immune to any sort of external challenge. And so it's a really, really, really powerful like immune system for this sort of virus to build around itself to protect the people it infected from uh, sort of leaving the cult. Okay. So what I'd like to do, and I probably need to wrap up it eventually, you've covered a lot of great ground here. And what I like is that you not only frame the problem, the root causes of it, what's, what's driving all of this, the consequence if we don't change it, plus you're coming up with solutions. You're, you have recommended you know, prescriptions for how to fix this. Um, and then we're also, uh, you're also de delving into, well, what, what's going to keep this from happening? There's some thinking that's keeping uh, that, that, that stands in the way of maybe, um, you know, re-educating the world or getting people to think differently, et cetera, right? Because they have this ingrained thinking. Um, they don't want to deal with cognitive dissonance, et cetera. I am five foot eight, 196 pounds. Yeah. That's fact. I need to be 175. I'm okay with uh, acknowledging the fact that I'm 20 plus pounds overweight. It doesn't, you know, but no, I, my, the alternative that you're talking about is, oh no, you need to accept me and tell me that 196 pounds, I'm 150. No. Right? Well, I would be pretty hateful not to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so I, I, I love where this is going. I, I'm curious how people can connect with you. I'm curious how they can learn more about uh, your institute, your podcast, your writings, et cetera. Where should people go to see all that? Well, I'll, I'll get to all that, but I'm going to start with the structure, you know, what's the problem? And then we'll get to all that, right? So okay, cool. problem, what's causing it today? There's a number of things that we haven't touched on. First one we haven't touched on is biological. You know, uh, uh, male sperm rates have declined by over 50, 51% in the last 50 years. You know, I, uh, testosterone rates have declined by something like 30% in the last 20 years. It might be 20% in the last 30 years. Whatever, it's like a huge amount. Um, if you're looking at, um, you know, endocrine disruptors in our environment, you know, one great study we saw recently, we've talked about this a lot on our program, is that like males and females are changing, like biologically. So endocrine disruptors, which are really big, there's been some studies that look on male children that were... Uh, exposed to endocrine disruptors in utero and they had a lower an endocrine disruptor. Distance. What? What's an endocrine disruptor? Oh, uh, it basically disrupts the hormones that are used in uh, gender differentiation, uh, both as an adult and and uh, in utero. So, like an so estrozole, estro like plastic, estrogens, repressors. Well, to... You can look it up. Yeah. But there was one great study that showed that that these infants that were in utero, these male infants, they were born with lower anogenital distance, which basically shows they hadn't fully differentiated into males. And when they were seven years old, there was a follow-up study that showed that they exhibited less male-like play behavior. They they played more like a, a female would play. So we have all of these, these things, you know, from testosterone to sperm rates, everything like that. And then in women, you know, I think most people who know women who have tried to get pregnant today, a huge number of them are having a real hard time getting pregnant. We are becoming increasingly infertile. And the reason that is happening is when the environmental activists were out there trying to remove all these things that caused cancer, that caused all these other problems in humans, that caused problems in our environment, uh, the one thing they didn't care about at all is things that caused infertility or things that caused like gen different like like, gender um, patterns. Right. Yeah, and, and so they just didn't care. And like, I, I guess I get it, you know, like it didn't align with their ideology at the time. It didn't matter. They were trying to lower population rates anyway. Um, so uh the, these things exist at really high rates in our in our environments today so we are biologically becoming less fertile we are socially becoming less fertile this is what we've talked about with this you know urban monoculture right mm -hmm. and we are um uh, uh economically becoming less fertile and this is for a reason different than people think it's not that we can't afford to raise kids anymore it's that laws are being put in place by those in positions of power that make it less economically feasible to have kids often the more wealth you have you know th this can be things like car seat regulations or stuff like that you know which really limit you to the number of car seats you can fit in a car whereas for a population to stay stable you know as we often say uh if you have a population where a third of people are having no kids and a third of people are having two kids. And I think this is broadly Gen Z would say this 
it would be generous for them. That means for them to say stable, the final third would have to have over four kids. That's just like very difficult to do. And well over four kids, six, seven, eight kids. Um, but uh, the, the, the biggest economic problem around kids is actually capitalism. Now, I love capitalism, right? I think it's a great economic system. The problem is, is it's very bad at thinking long term. Um, and this is the core reason why wealthy people have less kids than less wealthy people, is the economic system is very good at uh, dynamically judging the value of an individual to its productivity and can pay them the minimum amount it needs to to get them to not spend time on other things, i.e. their family and stuff like that. And because it's, you know, it, it almost systemically incapable of thinking long term, unless you put like, the political mandates, like people who have a certain number of kids don't have to pay taxes or something. Um, you, you, it's unable to adjust for that. And, and that is partially why people who have more money have less kids. And it's partially why in countries where the average wage is under $5,000, those are often the only countries with above repopulation fertility rate. And, and what's happening there is that... Um, uh, they're not really engaged in the modern economic system. They're, 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 you know, when you're at that low level of wealth. But the other thing to note is if you like grade countries and you're like, okay, who has the highest fertility rate, uh, you know, versus the lowest, generally it grades on how much wealth that country has, you know, except you will notice outliers all over the place. Right. And the, the core thing that you find with outliers is how much hope they have in the future and how much hope they have in the future for their people. Um, a great example of this is the only really persistent fertility gain that has ever happened in a country. Countries have tried weird things like Romania tried banning abortion and it like raised fertility rate for like two years and then it came crashing down again. Um, the only place where we've seen a persistent jump in a country that had a really low fertility rate was Georgia during, I want to say the Rose Revolution or the Revolution of Roses. Um, where we saw a really big fertility gain afterwards. And that was when they kicked out the last of the communist uh, uh, political class uh, because they had hope again, you know? And this is why you see, um, you know, in China right now, the reason they're having such a hard time motivating uh, reproduction is um, I, I think that the classic, the lying flat movement or the uh, the classic example here would be the we are the last generation meme where somebody was knocking on their door and was like, if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, uh, you and your family for three generations will be punished by the government. And they go, oh, well, we are the last generation. And they slam the door on them. Um, and what they meant by that is if you, and, and this is a sentiment you see in a lot of countries, when people feel like they're having kids just for the benefit of like an economic ruling elite class so they can stay in their positions of cush economic power, they're not going to do it, right? And this is why block countries have so few kids often compared to their economic situation. Um, however, uh, it's also why Israel has such a high fertility rate because, you know, when a Jew in Israel is having a kid, they don't feel like they're doing it to to benefit the economic elite of their country. They're doing it to because they like being Jewish. They want more Jews. They think this is a system that works. Um, and And I think that that's something that we really need to, for all of the people who are going to get through this, they need to learn to build a culture that they are proud of and that they believe there is some form of hope for in the future and to not teach this mental desolation to our kids because of this doomerism pervades the world today. Um, and then to the question of how do we fix this? Well, we've been working on a few things. You know, I was mentioning dating things. So we're doing this with the Pronatalist Institute. You can check us out at pronatalist.org. Um, uh, but uh, the, the biggest project we're working on right now is the Collins Institute, which is collinsinstitute.org. Um, and with this, we're trying to create an alternate education system other than the public education system that is better performing and that doesn't try to indoctrinate kids into this urban monoculture. Because if it turns out that only the sort of deviant individuals within our society, those with some sort of like ideological mutation that somehow makes them uh, still create kids within current like economic and social environments, well, we need to protect them. You know, we need to build, uh, we need to help them thrive without trying to deconvert them. A lot of people think like, why are you not trying to make people, more people just like you? Like, like, why don't you just convert people to your way of thinking? And I'm like, look, we are in an incredibly precarious position as a species right now. Every family is a hypothesis right now, a hypothesis for how we can intergenerationally motivate reproduction. And we are at a higher chance of losing civilizationally the fewer hypotheses are being tested. Um, and so that's why I don't, you know, I, my family's got our hypothesis. You try your thing. Um, and then finally, the place where we've been putting a lot of effort these days is base camp. We have a book series, five books, the relationships, 
the government and crafting religion. Crafting religion is probably the best of the theories, I think. Uh, one of them was the Wall Street Journal bestseller recently, top the nonfiction list. Um, so they did do pretty good. Um, but uh, they all sell for like a dollar or like two dollars. Like we take no money from them. It all goes to charity. Um, but our core thing right now is a podcast, which is Base Camp, and we do an episode every weekday. Um, if, if people are interested in, in reaching out or joining this, I, I think the core thing we're trying to do here is just begin to build a movement, begin to build awareness of this civilizational game at play and stop playing the old game. Um, you know, we want to build an alliance of the groups that, that will exist into the future. And these groups don't fall exactly into traditional, you know, optimization functions around traditional progressivism or traditional conservatism. You know, one of the things I always point out here is if you look uh, between countries, so the, the progressive mindset they hear for totally raise their falling, they go, give cash handouts. And you're like, well, that doesn't rock. Hungary spent 5% of its GDP last year doing that and only got fertility rates up by like 1.6%, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't seem to work. Um, and there's been great, great long, large studies on this. You, you get very, you can do it, but it just costs too much to be sustainable. Um, and, and then conservatives are like, well, ban immigration. Like, let's keep our country as it is, like homogenous. And I'm like, well, the problem is, is we know what happens. Other countries have tried this. Korea has tried this, right? You know, the countries with the lowest fertility rate in the world today, if you're looking at wealthy countries, are the least diverse. The countries with the highest fertility rate in the world today, wealthy countries, are the most diverse. You're looking at countries like the U.S. and Israel right now, right? Um, and, and and it's for all people within within that cultural group. So it's just being aware of the new game. And the new game uh, is is this I guess sort of a individual hypothesis or cultural group hypothesis and helping your cultural group into the future instead of focusing overly on, on uh, national identity and stuff like that. That's a common feature at dark ages where if you want to look at civilizational cycles, things go on to a more local level because a dark age occurs when your macro civilizational strategy is no longer effective. And so mm -hmm. when the Roman strategy is no longer effective, you have the French strategy, the uh, Italian strategy, the uh, North African strategy, and um, I, I can see that happening in our future. Um, thank you so much for coming, Malcolm. It's been a pleasure. I had a great time, and I really respect your work. And uh, you know, everyone should really just binge his videos over and over again <laughs> if you want to get an understanding of what's really going on in the world today. Yeah. Well, this was fascinating, and I appreciate you articulating these things very well. I really appreciate it. And I hope more people sort of come up because this issue should um, go beyond left or right. This is not a left or right issue. It's not a race issue, et cetera. It is a survival of the species issue. And I think what you're doing is very important. We appreciate your being with us. I loved joining you guys. Great conversation. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>